In this lecture, we're going to talk about gas insulated substations. Now, when we talk about gas insulated substations, we are talking about gases other than air. In normal substations, air is the insulating medium. When you have conductor, phase conductor to phase conductor, from any conductor to ground, the basic insulation is air. And the advantage or advantages of air insulated substations is pretty obvious. Air is abundantly available. It is free of cost, available free of cost. And uh, we do not need to take uh, any action to maintain air at atmospheric temperature and pressure. So in, we don't only use air as the insulating medium, we use air at, at normal, at one atmospheric pressure and normal temperature, atmospheric temperature as the insulating medium. While this is an advantage, there are situations while this may not be uh, the it may not be desirable to use air. And that is because when you're using air, we are having to work with the dielectric strength of air and dielectric strength of air under uh, atmospheric conditions, which is even lower than 30 kV per centimeter, which means that as we go for higher and higher voltages, we need larger and larger amounts of air. That means we need larger clearances between two components in a substation. And this may become impractical as we go to higher voltages. And in recent times, space is at a pre premium. So when you need to provide bigger and bigger clearances, it means that you will have to build your substation over a very large extended area. And as the voltage increases, the area increases also. But in recent times, there are situations where this may not be viable. For example, if you're working in urban areas, in crowded urban areas, we may not have that kind of large free area accessible to us. Not only in urban areas, let us say you want to build um, a transmission uh, a line in a hilly mountainous region. And let's say it's a very difficult terrain. And if you need a large extended area, clear a large extended area and build a substation there, that may not be, I mean, firstly, it may not be possible, or even if it is possible, it may become very expensive to clear out, to level that amount of space. So the primary idea is that instead of using air, use an insulating medium, which needs less clearance between parts. So you can build within a smaller area build on a smaller area you take up less space and therefore you need gas and if you need gas other than air you also need an enclosure in which the gas has to be encapsulated so you need an enclosed transmission system uh, a transmission substation you need an enclosed system the all the components all everything goes inside this enclosure and within that enclosure you will have a gas which may be at atmospheric pressure most of the time it will not be at atmospheric pressure it will be pressurized gas which will provide the insulation and therefore it will need less space between uh, Different, part, different parts of the com different components of the assembly. So uh, also um, when you enclose, it means that your components are not exposed to the air. And if there might be situations where the atmosphere is not very uh, kind to the components, if you're in a very heavily contaminated region where there is a lot of pollution, there are lots of con contaminants. If you're in the coastal region with a lot of salt, if you're in a desert region with a lot of uh, sand, all these can be detrimental. And all these things can be avoided if you have a clean chamber inside which your components are placed. So that means more expense, of course, but we will see what uh, that gas insulation, gas insulated substation entails. When we talk about gas insulated substations, we are therefore talking about a compact multi-component assembly, which is enclosed in a grounded metallic housing. Of course, the metallic housing has to be grounded. And the primary insulating medium is SF6 or sulfur hexafluoride. And the assembly Inside will include buses, switches, circuit breakers, and other associated equipment. So the entire paraphernalia is housed inside the enclosure, and the enclosure is filled with SF6, and that provides the insulation. The first gas-insulated switch gear assemblies were designed for high voltage levels in the 1920s, 
Uh, what we started doing, we took a circuit breaker and the circuit breaker originally had oil as the insulating medium. This oil was removed and replaced with um, gases. And the first gas that was used for enclosed switch gear was freon. The world's first SF6 high voltage gas insulated switch gear was introduced in the market in 1968. The reason SF6 was chosen is that it is, it, is, it is a good insulating medium in the sense that it has high dielectric breakdown strength. And in case of circuit breakers or switch gear, another important uh, property of the insulating medium is its arc quenching property. SF6 has good arc quenching properties and therefore SF6 was first in switch gears and then only it came to be used in gas insulated substations. So what are the saline features of gas insulated substations? We need enclosures, everything goes inside the enclosure and it is like a module. So the gas insulated substation is factory pre-assembled. It is a tested unit. You buy it as a unit and then you just assemble it on site. Uh, I mean, just put various modules together on site. The modules are pre-assembled. The advantage is that the life goes up because you're protecting it already. So the operating life tends to be greater than 50 years. And not only that, you don't even need a major inspection before 25 years. You're good for 25 years. You don't even have to worry about it. There are motor operated self lubricated mechanisms. Minimal clearing is required. M minimum clearing, cleaning is required. It is corrosion resistant. There is the probability of fault is reduced considerably because there isn't the provision for a lot of uh, undue um, interventions. So fault probability is low. It is protected against aggressive environmental conditions. This is something that I've already mentioned, pollutants, um, contaminants, seismic resistance. When you have earthquakes, if you have open, high, uh, large extended structures, they're vulnerable to earthquakes. However, when you have something that is encapsulated, which is much more compact, it is less uh, likely to be damaged by earthquake. The most important thing is the space requirement is less than 20% of comparable air insulated substation. This is, of course, very, very significant. Now, when you look at uh, gas insulated switch gear, as I already mentioned, the most commonly or almost universally used insulin is sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride is not only used in just gas insulated substations, it is used as an insulin in a wide range of uh, system applications. It includes switch gear, gas insulated substation components, transformers, gas insulated cables. Sulfur hexafluoride is the insulation insulating medium of choice in very many situations. What is the reason? The reason is primarily because it has very high dielectric strength. The high dielectric strength of SF6 is several times more than that of air. I think it's about three times more than that of air. It is chemically stable, so it does not decompose very in, uh, easily. It does decompose under conditions, but not easily. It is non-toxic. It is non-flammable. It has good heat transfer capabilities. And as I have already mentioned, it has excellent arc quenching capacities. Another important thing is it can be, it has a high vapor pressure. So even when we go down to pretty low temperature, it remains as a gas and does not become a liquid. So a uh, insulating medium, which is a gas has certain advantages. It can fill up entire space available. There will be no gaps remaining. Um, it is so, we want to use a gas, we don't want to use a liquid. And SF6 remains a liquid up to very low temperature. So as I have initially mentioned in the beginning of this course, that when you choose an insulating medium, you are certainly looking at its dielectric properties, but at the same time, you're looking at some non-electrical properties, non-dielectric properties, because that is also of significance. So taken together, SF6 is a good insulating medium of choice. And as I said, it is used in very many places. Now, the reason that SF6 has a high breakdown strength very high breakdown strength is primarily because of its one significant property, and that is that of electrical 
electron attachment. SF6 is a highly electronegative gas. So, for example, if a neutral SF6 molecule comes in proximity, collides with an electron, it will capture the electron and create an SF6 negative ion. Which means that instead of, if you remember, whenever we have breakdown, the breakdown progresses by electron multiplication. So we are looking at ionization. Whenever there is a collision between a neutral particle and electron, the electron will impart energy and at, uh, you might have uh, more than one electron generated or at best you will have excited molecules which will go to a higher energy state and ultimately release electrons. So you need multiplication of electrons. And if you can prevent multiplication of electrons, you can prevent breakdown. And that is exactly what SF6 does. Whenever it comes in, uh, when a neutral molecule comes, collides with an electron, instead of producing more electrons, it captures the electrons. So instead of multiplying, it removes electrons from the picture. And as a result, it returns breakdown. Now, it is not uh, entirely true that the only kind of interaction that is possible between SF6 uh, molecules and electrons is that of electron attachment. Collisional ionization is also possible. So when an SF6 neutral molecule collides with an electron, there are two kinds of reactions possible. One is, of course, the one that we've already discussed, that of electron at attachment. The other possibility is that SF6 neutral molecule can actually get ionized. So you are left with a positive ion and two Electron. So you do have multiplication. So the possibility is that there would be electron -elect attachment as well as collisional ionization depending upon the energy contents of the um, colliding particles. So basically what you would have is you would have a competition between two different pathways. But mostly this has a significant effect. So the net ionization, we can think about a net ionization coefficient. If you remember when we talked about Townsend ionization, we talked about the Townsend's primary ionization coefficient or the Townsend's first ionization coefficient, which is the number of ionizing collisions per electron per unit centimeter travel in the distance of the, in the gap between the two electrodes, in the interelectron gap. That gives us the number of electrons being produced. To that, we have to add this electron attachment. Let's say eta is the electron attachment. Let's define eta as the ionized uh, attachment coefficient. Number of electrons which are removed from the um, gas per unit travel of an electron, uh, per unit distance travel of each electron. So therefore, if we had originally an alpha ionization coefficient, this alpha ionization coefficient will be now be reduced by the number of attachments per centimeter per electron. So now we can talk about a net ionization coefficient, which is a result of the ionizing and attaching collisions, which will give us alpha minus eta. So let's call that alpha bar. Alpha bar is the modified ionization coefficient. The modification takes place due to the attachment uh, coefficient. So therefore, at any distance x from the cathode, we can define the number of electrons dnx as alpha minus eta into nx dx. So if you start with nx number of electrons and it travels dx distance, then we will have at a distance dnx, we will have an increase in the number of electrons by dnx, which is given by alpha bar nx dx, where alpha bar is alpha minus eta. And therefore, the total number of electrons that will be produced by this combination of attachment and uh, ionizing collisions is given by exponential integration 0 to x alpha bar dx, exponential alpha bar x. So from 0 to d, we have to multiply. But so if you think about it, if you imagine that Townsend coefficient is likely to cause breakdown in SF6 gases, we know that the Townsend's breakdown criteria will be suitably modified. So we had a Townsend's, modify, a Townsend's criteria as uh, in the presence of the primary and secondary coefficients, 1 minus gamma e to the power alpha d minus 1 equal to 0. This will be modified. Instead of alpha, we will work with alpha bar, and that will give us an ionization coefficient which is less than Townsend's uh, criterion without attachment. And so the you will need higher voltages to satisfy Townsend's ionization coefficient. 
So it is possible to establish the term modified Townsend's established uh, the modified criteria for Townsend's breakdown after including the elect electron attachments. But mostly in SF6, it is not Townsend's breakdown criteria that uh, causes breakdown. Rather, we see streamer breakdown. So if we talk about the streamer breakdown, we know that Townsend's breakdown can give rise to streamer breakdown under certain conditions. And this conditions being that the critical density of space charge has to be uh, satisfied. So there has to be an enough intergap length so that sufficient quantity of space charge is produced before the electrons reach the other electrode, uh, before the electrons reach from one electrode to other, before it can traverse the entire interelectrode distance, there will be sufficient number of electron multiplication so that a critical avalanche size is reached. So at a critical avalanche size, which is given by exponential to the power alpha bar x is equal to nc, nc being uh, in the range of 10 to the power 8 uh, electrons, the space charge field becomes high enough. So when you have a sufficient or a critical number of electrons, the space charge field due to this accumulated electrons is high enough such that streamers will be generated. Streamers, if you remember, are generated by photoionization from various points where the space charge field modifies the electric fields in considerably so that you have fills high enough for photoionization. So before the end, so first you have electron multiplication as per Townsend's phenomena. And then when there is sufficient amount of electrons produced so that space charge is accumulated in the inter-electrode distance before the entire electron avalanche has had time to reach the other electrode, there are several regions where space charge accumulation is high enough so that photoionization becomes. And when photoionization happens, there is a streamer generation, and these streamers propagate at the speed of 10 to the power 8 centimeter per second. That is because of the photon movement. So when these streamers are produced in such abundance that they are able to bridge the gap, a highly conducting channel is formed and you have complete breakdown. So that is the process of breakdown that you would expect in SF6, where you have space charge accumulation leading to photoionization, leading to streamer propagation. The streamers travel because the streamers do not actually have to have the charges traveling from one point to another, but just the photons which need to travel and create more avalanches. A highly conducting channel can be formed within a few nanoseconds. Dielectric strength of SF6 is three times that of air. And to get an idea, even though it's gaseous at a pressure of six bar, the dielectric strength of SF6 can be approximately the same as that of transformer oil. Now, when you talk about breakdown in gas insulated substations, remember we have highly divergent fields which can be possible inside a GIS. For example, you have conduct so GIS normally has a coaxial uh, configuration. You have the conductor in the middle at the center, and then you have the metallic enclosure. And in between the two, you have the insulating medium. So you have a coaxial structure. However, highly divergent fields are possible in the sense in the inner conductor, you may have free metallic particles or on the surface of the insulator. You do have insulators. For example, you have spaces to hold the um, conductor in position periodically, just like you have the transmission wires, which holds up the overhead transmission line and prevents it from sagging. You similarly have spacers, which provides mechanical uh, support to the uh, inner conductor. You also have other insulators and there might be uh, metallic particles deposited on the insulator surface and all these things, then there can be manufacturing defects, there can be protrusions from the conductor. So there can be many things happening. In fact, you have a lot of free particles which can cause uh, local divergent fields. And this is where breakdown can initiate in a GIS. Now, we normally see two basic kinds of breakdowns in GIS. One is the corona stabilized breakdown and the other is the leader breakdown. What is a corona stabilized breakdown? Uh, we have actually discussed this mechanism when we talked about gaseous breakdowns. Now, when you have, a, let's say, a pointed electrode, 
We always simulate this with a model, this with a little plane electrode. Let's say the pointed electrode is positively charged. Now, when you have ionization in this highly divergent region, as you remember, the negative particles have very little distance to travel and they will be quickly absorbed by the positive electrode. But you will be left with a large quantity of positive charges which wants to travel to the negative electrode, which is far away. And therefore, you have essentially an extension of the positive electrode. And this extension uh, of the positive electrode is kind of more uh, extended in front of the needle. So instead of having a highly pointed structure, you now have effectively a positive electrode, which is much more, has a much higher radius. And therefore, it acts like a shield. So the space charge has a shielding effect. It is like an extended, it doesn't extend to a great distance, it extends a very small distance, but effectively it has, it gives the conductor an effectively higher radius so that the field goes down. So the space charge tends to shield the point and stabilizes the field. So even before it's maybe may very close to the onset value, but because of the conductor radius, uh, the radius of the uh, effective increase in the radius of the needle, what you have is the field goes down. So very close to the onset value, the, there will, the space, the field will stabilize. You will not have more space charge and breakdown does not happen. So your corona kind of stabilizes the breakdown. Now, when you reach the voltage, the space charge density will increase and therefore you will have an even higher, bigger radius and therefore the shielding effect also intensifies. So essentially this corona which happens, which is not nice. It is happening in a small region, but that is what, what is causing, which is preventing ultimate breakdown. And this is called corona stabilized breakdown. Of course, this protection can be obtained only to a certain extent. After that, so you're very close to the onset value, shielding effect is there, the field is brought down. Now, if you increase the voltage further, what will happen is there will be more and more space charge and the large number of space, the, large amount of space charge that is produced will no longer be able to provide sufficient shielding. In fact, it will take part in the breakdown and filamentary leader discharges will develop around the space charge. So it will stop shielding because once you're above the critical onset level, what the space charge does is as soon as you reach close to the onset level, it brings the field down. It keeps bringing the field down up to a certain voltage. Beyond that voltage, it cannot, even if it brings down the field, the Space charge field in the applied field, when the applied field becomes very high, even the high space charge field will not be able to reduce the applied fields below the onset value. So now even with space charge shielding, you are above the onset value and therefore breakdown will onset and the space charge particles will now take part in the discharges and filamentary discharges will develop around the space charge and in this way breakdown will happen. But at the same time, we must remember that when you have corona stabilized breakdown, you need higher voltages for breakdown. The breakdown will happen, but it will happen at higher voltages. The other possibility is that of a leader breakdown. Now this you will mostly see when you have a rapidly increasing voltage. If the voltage increases rapidly, there will be some initial streamers can happen and they can be quite intense. So instead of having corona which causes stabilizing, you will straight away have streamers which are quite intense and these streamers will lead to the formation of highly ionized leader channel. So the space charge to provide stability needs some time to accumulate and it gently, so when you're raising the voltage slowly, the uh, space charge is accumulating. So as you raise the voltage, it brings down the breakdown voltage, it breaks down the field and some kind of balance is reached. But if you increase the voltage very rapidly, what will happen is very soon, the even before enough corona, uh, if, even if there is enough space charge, to bring down the field, you will have at some points very high field intensification. Streamers will develop, photoionization will happen, and as a result, an ionized leader channel will form. And every ionized leader channel, it uh, tries to progress in the direction of the electric field. Now, what will happen is from this, more branch channels will form. There will be more streamers which are pro uh, being produced. But ultimately, so 
you may have this kind of branching and this kind of branching will kind of take away the uh, particles and the ionized channels in several directions and will kind of prevent it from actually bridging the gap. But a point will come with, with high enough voltage that the leader resistance, the resistance of the leader path is much lower than the path along the other streamers. And as a result, the entire charge will tend to flow through this leader and this leader will bridge the gap. So with rapidly rising voltage, the initial streamers can be very intense so that in highly ionized leader will be formed even before there is time for space charge uh, stabilization. And if the voltage is high enough, if the streamer corona is large enough, you will have a step leader discharge that will be initiated and ultimately that can lead to breakdown. So these are the two main mechanisms by which breakdown can happen in GIS from divergent fields. Uniform field breakdown does not normally occur. Apart from that, there is another kind of breakdown mechanism which is likely in, very likely in GIS, which we have not really discussed before, and that is particle initiated breakdown. Now, we must remember that free conducting particles, which is also called FCP, are the most common cause of failure in gas insulated substation. Because of the assembly, there might be a lot of free particles which are present inside the GIS enclosure. Despite actions taken, despite action taken by the manufacturer, despite the clean environment in which manufacturing and assembly takes place, there is still the possibility of free conducting particles which are produced by the assembly and the manufacturing processes, which will remain within the encapsulation. Now, what happens is when you apply the electric field, these particles will get charged. And if they're free particles, and by free particles, I mean that they're not attached to any um, stationary components inside the GIS, these particles can get charged by the applied electric field. And as a result, they will tend to move in the direction of the field. Remember, this is a coid shell field. So you have the inner cylinder and you have the outer cylinder. And if on the outer cylinder, inner surface of the outer cylinder, there are free particles, they will act in the direction of the field. They will tend to move in the direction of the field and they will be lifted off. So, when the particles get charged by the applied field, they will lift off. If these particles are rod shaped, instead of being spherical, they're more likely to be, you know, rod shaped. So if they're rod shaped, they will stand up on the outer conductor because they will have non-uniform charge. So it will behave like a dipole. So you will have a, it will stand up on the outer conductor and there will be considerable field intensification. And that can result in partial discharge, discharges initiating from these particles. If you have a DC stress, then once these particles stand up, they will also be accelerated in the direction of the field. And they act up when the voltage goes above a certain value at the onset voltage, these particles will not only lift up, they will cross the gap and they will reach the inner conductor. If it is AC, what will happen is it will lift up, but before it can move very close to the inner conductor, it will drop off again as the voltage polarity changes. So it will make small hopping excursions at the outer line. So it lifts off and comes back, lifts off and comes back. So hopping excursions will be made. And as every time it comes back, it is lifted, it is charged, it has a potential, and then the polarity changes, and because of gravity, it quickly drops. When it quickly drops, it has a potential difference between the grounded electrode, where it drops, and the particle at the point of, at the point when it drops off. And as a result, a PD will occur. So at DC, when you have, if there will be no excursions, it will continue to move to slowly, continuously tend to move towards the inner electrode. Now, as you increase the voltage in DC, the particles may cross the gap and it will reach the upper electrode. When it reaches the upper electrode, it will receive new charge. It will be charged in a different way. And then it will again move back towards the lower electrode. And therefore, voltage with voltage increase, necessary conditions for leader breakdown may be achieved. In case of AC also, the hopper ex hopping excursions will become bigger and bigger. So you will have longer hopping, longer excursions. And as a result, when it comes back, it will have higher charge and the discharges will increase. So the, inter the time between uh, discharges will decrease, increase, but the discharges will be higher because you will be involved with more charge. So essentially, and with DC, it may even reach the inner electrode and stay there and in that region may cause discharge. 
So in coaxial electrode system, breakdown is most likely to occur when a particle strikes the inner conductor just as the voltage reaches a maximum. So as it is coming, if it is AC, let's say as the voltage increases, the hopping excursions become longer and longer and it keeps on lifting off. And let us imagine that the point at which it reaches the inner electrode is when the potential is maximum positive maximum and it is at that instant it is as if the high voltage conductor has a protruding electrotrusion it has a particle attached to it so the equivalence it, it is the equivalent situation of having a protrusion on the high voltage conductor which can also happen with dc as it lifts off it can reach the inner conductor and the particle can get attached to the outer condu uh, inner conductor and behave as a protrusion of the high voltage conductor and in these cases what would happen is there would be considerably high partial discharges and these partial discharges may uh, transform into complete discharges. So complete breakdown in a coaxial system is most likely to occur when a particle strikes the inner conductor either because of DC or it reaches because of EC and reaches uh, the DC conductor, uh, DC re reaches the inner conductor when the positive maximum is reached. So partial initiated breakdown discharges due to particles is the most common cause. In fact, also apart from particles tra traversing, there might be conduct, there might be particles on the conductors because of sharp protrusions, because of embedded structures, or there might be even particles embedded in the epoxy insulation, which can cause uh, breakdown at high voltages.